How to build a model steam engine, Stuart Models Victoria, part 7, machining the crankshaft. At first sight, this may seem to be a very simple job. It's a piece of steel bar, and all I have to do is machine a bit off the end of it to fit the crank web onto. There's more to it than that. On the original Stuart drawing, it shows a crankshaft of 7 sixteenths of an inch in diameter, and you're supposed to turn that out of the piece of mild steel that comes with the kit of castings. And this is supposed to be turned down to 7 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. But I'm not going to use it, I'm modifying this part of the design. And right or wrongly, I'm going to make the crankshaft half an inch in diameter, which will make it slightly stronger. And where bearing surfaces are concerned, bigger is better. And here is the aforementioned piece of mild steel that comes with the kit of castings. What I'm doing at the moment is vacuuming up my lathe. This is something that I seldom do, but in this case I need it very clean because I'm going to fit a dial test indicator which has a magnetic base which sticks to the cast iron bed and holds the dial test indicator firmly in place. This dial test indicator is an essential tool for the workshop and it allows me to check that my lathe chuck is true. Quite surprising, you can put a piece of bar in your three jaw chuck that you think is accurate and then you use the DTI or dial test indicator to check the accuracy of rotation. It's far better engineering practice to use one of these. This is called a collet and it fits in a special collet chuck and I have one of these with many different sizes that fits in the larger of my two lathes. As I frequently mention, these tutorials are designed for the beginner to the hobby of model engineering and most beginners do not have a collet chuck just laying about in the workshop waiting to be used for a job like this. And in any case, because this is a half an inch diameter piece of bar, that's designed to be turned down to 7 sixteenths of an inch diameter, with the end part turned down to 3 eighths of an inch in diameter to suit the crank web, you could really use any old chuck for this because if you're just turning the part from scratch and the entire part is turned, it's going to be accurate. But if I want to use this piece of metal as the finished diameter, it needs to run very accurately so that the 3 eighths of an inch part that I turn on the end is concentric with the diameter of the rest of the piece. And that's why I'm using a DTI, dial test indicator. I've got the DTI in position, pressing against the shaft, and as I rotate the chuck, I want to watch the needle and see how far it moves away from not moving at all. In an ideal world, it wouldn't move at all. And I could really cheat by showing the DTI and freezing the video, but I'm not doing that. You're seeing the entire picture here. And as you can see, as I rotate the chuck, it hardly moves at all. So this is near enough for jazz, rock and roll, and even country and western. A good tip is to use a new tip on the carbide tipped cutting tool. And I wouldn't like to say that after a couple of glasses of wine. Anyway, the idea is use a nice sharp cutting tool so you get a good finish. First of all, as usual, I always face across the end of the work, followed by a centre drill. Why am I centre drilling the end? No reason, because I'm not going to use anything to put in this centre. But if you look at most steam engines, on an axle or a crankshaft, you will see a large centre in the end of them because they will have been turned at some stage between centres. I'm not going to do that, but for effect I need to have the centre in position. Just to confirm the thickness of the crank web, and it's 3 eighths of an inch, so I need to turn down 3 eighths of an inch of the end of this piece of bar. This is something I often do. I've marked the position of 3 eighths of an inch down from the end of the shaft, and I'm just making a mark with the tool. So now I have a line up to which I'm going to cut. And here goes the first cut. I'm not taking too much off. And the first thing I do is just check that I haven't taken too much off to start with. And of course, no, I haven't. So I continue down to the line, removing a little bit of metal. And then a bit more. Some machining operations can be really nerve-wracking, which is bad for your health. And other ones, like this one, are very simple and very straightforward. And if I make a mistake, it's no big deal. If I cut this undersize, all I need to do really is turn off the entire end of the piece of metal and start again. But I'm not going to do that. Sometimes I'll get right to the last cut and just take a tiny bit too much and it's a rattle fit. I've said this before in other videos, but when I was a beginner, I generally made parts three times. And the sequence usually went something like this. Mark out the part. Mark out all the positions for the holes in the wrong place. Drill the holes and throw the part in the scrap bin. Part two. Mark out the part correctly. Drill all the holes in the right place and break a drill in the last hole and throw the part in the scrap bin. Then mark out the positions once again correctly. Drill all the holes without breaking a drill 
and end up with a finished component that actually works. So this job is really simple relative to some of the parts you have to make. Some people watching this will be cringing as usual and I'm sure they'll send me messages to tell me off about it. But I really am not an engineer that I keep telling you that. I'm not an engineer. That's why it's so good for beginners to watch this because I approach things like a beginner in a lot of ways. Except this beginner has had about 45 years of experience of being a beginner. For instance, what I should be doing is taking measurements all the time with the micrometer and looking at the numbers on the micrometer. Then I would rotate the lathe hand wheel and I would look at the graduations and for instance I may take one thou off. So I rotate the lathe hand wheel just one thou on the graduations on the hand wheel. But please remember if you take one thou off on the hand wheel it's really removing two thou and it's very confusing at first. But after a while you get used to it. I didn't take great pains with this one to be honest. This is just a piece of mild steel that's going to go in my spare pieces of mild steel box. This is going to be the proper crankshaft. This is a piece of ground silver steel. Not only does it wear better than mild steel when it's in service, it's accurately ground to the dimension that I want, which in this case is half an inch. Just as before, I use the vacuum cleaner to first of all remove any swarf from the lathe slideways. Then I mount the dial test indicator using its magnetic base on the slideway and check the work for concentricity. And as you can see from this clip, the dial test indicator is hardly moving at all. This DTI needle is moving about as much as a Nats dick, which is an engineering term for not very much at all, a very small amount. So now let the turning commence. First of all, I face across the end as before, and I use a centre drill for reasons I've already explained. Then I mark the piece of silver steel with the lathe tool, so I know where I'm going to cut to, and then I take quite a good cut. This is what's known as a roughing cut, getting rid of a lot of the surplus material in one go. And even though my boxwood lathe is quite old, it still cuts very well without chattering, and as you've just seen with the dial test indicator, the chuck is quite accurate. To get through this sequence a little more quickly, the video is speeded up, but you can see clearly how well this silver steel cuts. The very last cut, as the cutting tool is up against the shoulder, I press the tool into the work to make a small groove. Because the tip of the cutting tool is rounded, it will not give a clean face for the crankweb to fit up against. You could of course chamfer the inside edge of the crankweb, it's just easier to press the tip of the cutting tool into the work very slightly to make the tiniest of grooves. And that way, as I've just said, the crankweb will perfectly locate against the shoulder. This is a very good fit on the crankweb, so it's quite successful, and I can cut it to length, which I did on the bandsaw, then I reversed it in the chuck, and I'm cleaning up the other end. Once again, there is a modification to the drawing. On the drawing, it shows the length of the crankshaft as being four and three quarter inches. It actually shows it as being four and three eighths up to the shoulder, and a further three eighths, which is four and six eighths, which is four and three quarters, and that's imperial for you. And what I'm doing at the moment is, as usual, facing across the end of the piece of bar. And I'm going to use the centre drill once again to drill a centre in it for no reason other than it will look right. My modification is that the crankshaft I'm working on is five and a quarter inches long. And there's a reason for this. I have a Stuart Models Victoria steam plant and the crankshaft on that is five inches long. Because on the end of it, it has a water pump. So I thought, well, I may as well preempt this because maybe I'll fit a water pump to this, I don't know. If I'd have followed the drawing to the letter, the crankshaft is long enough to go through the main bearings, the eccentric sheave, the flywheel and the pulley. But by making it longer, it just gives a little bit more flexibility. It makes it future proof for any accessories. It's always worth remembering that a perfect 90 degree cut is razor sharp, so always remove the sharp edges. But make sure you don't get your hand caught in the chuck doing it this way. What have I managed to achieve doing this? Well, I think I've achieved a better, harder wearing crankshaft. You can see the mild steel because I've written mild steel on it and you can see the silver steel because I wrote on that as well. That can go into the spares box. And here is the finished crankshaft, five and a quarter inches long. There's just one more important detail to look at and you need to look at the full size article for this. Have a look at railway engine wheels, for instance, and the end of crankshafts. Generally speaking, the crankshaft or the axle protrudes ever so slightly, not a lot, just a tiny amount, and it just makes a world of difference. If it was flat, it wouldn't look as good. 
A final word about fits. These parts fit together very well, they're not tight and they're not slack. On a lot of the model steam engines I get to work on, the fits are dreadful. A rattle fit at best, but this is not going to be like that. And here's the crankshaft once again, showing the parts sticking out. You see what I mean, it looks better. As I've said before, every part of the model needs to be a working model within itself. And on that note, I will say thank you for watching and I hope you found it useful.